most of you know, our guest this evening um, has had most interesting experience in that particular area. He served for five years as director of the United Nations uh, Institute for uh, Research on Disarmament in Geneva. And then very recently, as you know, he served as the, um, the chairman of the Review and Extension uh, Conference on uh, the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And uh, the New York Times and other journals and papers were very uh, positive about the contributions which the ambassador made to what they thought was a very difficult and successful uh, conference. Prior to that fundamental experience, the ambassador has had uh, a life which is in, in, in marked by excellence. Of course, I asked the ambassador if there's anything else I, I should say to him besides what was on his resume, and he suggested probably you shouldn't know what's not on the resume. <laughs> and so everything I can see on the, on the resume suggests excellence in all things, which I believe is the correct pattern. Uh, he attended the, for uh, uh, his early education, uh, Trinity College in Candy, which is a uh, uh, secondary school of which he was voted the, uh, voted or given the award for the best all-round student. After that, he won a nationwide essay contest, which entitled him to attend as the country's representative to the World Youth Forum, which was sponsored by the Herald Tribune. He received honors in, his, uh, in receipt of his Bachelor of Arts degree later. He studied in the uh, School of Oriental and Asian Studies at the University of London and received his master's degree from American University in Washington. He scored first in the competitive examinations for entry to the Foreign Service in Sri Lanka, entered the Foreign Service in 1965, uh, was posted in a in important places, we think, in uh, Beijing and in New Delhi and uh, Washington and London. He also served uh, a tour in a senior position in the foreign ministry before uh, being posted to Washington. I already noted his experience as director of the UN mission. He, at that time, he was also Sri Lanka's amb ambassador to the UN operations in Geneva and accredited to Vienna uh, as well. Our, the point of the introduction is simple. The topic uh, is enormously important. The ambassador is uh, going to uh, review what transpired at that conference as a case history, and obviously uh, very few could uh, be better prepared for that particular task. So it's my great honor to present to you uh, Ambassador Jayantha Donapala. Thank you, Dr. Bird. Ladies and gentlemen, believe me, I'm extremely grateful for this invitation to address the Baltimore Council of World Affairs, despite the fact that I have had no connection with the O.J. Simpson trial, <laughs> nor am I going to pledge my support for any of the presidential contenders. But uh, this council has had a prestige which uh, exceeds the bounds of Baltimore, and I have been very privileged to be included amongst your speakers this evening. I uh, am particularly happy to be here and to see this uh, audience, despite the fact that uh, there was this threat of snow. It shows that there is life, normal life, after the O.J. Simpson trial, as I said, <laughs> and uh, after General Colin Powell decided to pull himself out of the race. The relationship between Baltimore and uh, Washington is a curious one. We are so close and yet so far away. But I think uh, there is uh, a very definite link. And if people in Washington are now becoming a little isolationist, perhaps, there is always the harbor and the 
contact that you have with the outside world, which I'm sure will keep Baltimore very much engaged with the rest of the world. And your Council of World Affairs has shown over and over again by the selection of your speakers how important you regard the leadership of the United States in world affairs today, particularly after the Cold War ended. And I think we should have more councils of this nature in this country in order to sensitize the people of the United States on what the rest of the world expects of the United States, a commitment to engagement in international affairs and a commitment to providing leadership, both political, moral, and economic. I did have, as uh, Dr. Bird said, the privilege of presiding over the review and extension conference of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. It seems to be my destiny now to talk indefinitely about it after having had the treaty <laughs> extended indefinitely. But I want to focus today about that conference as a case history of a multilateral disarmament conference, because I think there is a tendency to be cynical and critical about multilateralism as a principle in international affairs. And I want to try to show you that multilateralism can and does work, and that much of this cynicism is baseless, and that if we have the right chemistry, we can work together as a community of nations to achieve good things in the world. I'd like to divide my presentation into three parts. Let me first talk about the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and the run-up to the conference. Then let me move to the conference itself to give you something about the dynamics of a multilateral conference. And then finally, let me talk about the significance of the achievement of the conference and what lies ahead for us collectively. <coughs> now, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty is the cornerstone of the nuclear non-proliferation regime. It was signed in 1968. It entered into force in 1970. And today, it has a total of 181 members of that treaty, countries which have all decided that they would voluntarily renounce any further proliferation of nuclear weapons in order to have a safer and a better world. And this idea of the NPT arose from the nightmare vision which President John F. Kennedy had. He envisaged a world where unchecked there would be 25 to 30 nuclear weapon states. Well, thanks to this treaty, we have the same number of nuclear weapon states declared, five of them, and perhaps three threshold states or nuclear weapon capable states who are not within the treaty. I think that is saying a great deal for the strength of the international legal norm which the NPT has been able to establish as a result of countries getting together in order to sign this treaty. There are 10 articles in the treaty, and I will not go into a detailed analysis of it, but basically the treaty serves three purposes. One is the disarmament purpose, to try to ensure that countries who already have nuclear weapons and we have all five of those countries now within the treaty because France and China came into it later. They are pledged under Article 6 to negotiate in good faith to bring down the level of their nuclear weapons. There is fundamentally in Articles 1 and 2 a pledge on the part of the non-nuclear weapon states that they will not take any steps to acquire nuclear weapons in any way to uh, get the research or to develop or produce nuclear weapons. And thirdly, there is the aspect of international cooperation for the peaceful uses of nuclear energy, where in addition to the International Atomic Energy Agency assisting in this cooperation, there would also be the 
pledge on the part of the more developed countries to assist developing countries in the use of uh, nuclear energy for peaceful purposes such as in medicine, in uh, power, uh, in other fields such as uh, uh, agriculture and so on. And this again is one of the purposes of the treaty. Under Article 10 of the treaty, there was a requirement that 25 years after the treaty entered into force, which is in 1995, the parties to the treaty would get together to decide whether they would continue with the treaty in one of three ways, either indefinitely or for a continuation of a period, a fixed period, or several periods. And uh, it was the foreign policy decision of the United States and many other Western countries that their interests and the interests of the world were best going to be served by having an indefinite extension. There were other countries who were not so sure that this was the best way to proceed. They felt that one way on which they could have some leverage with the nuclear weapon states would be if there was a rolling period of maybe 25 years at a time, so that they could have the nuclear weapons states answerable every 25 years as to whether they had fulfilled their obligations under Article 6 to reduce their level of nuclear weapons. Eventually, as you know, we did decide to have an indefinite extension. There were the votes for it, but I think the achievement of the conference was that there were no winners or losers but that the treaty won because we ended the conference with the treaty greatly strengthened and with many obligations imposed upon the nuclear weapon states so that, for example, by the end of next year, we will have a comprehensive test ban treaty where there will be no more nuclear weapon tests in the world. And I think that represents a collective gain. And it is this collective gain that the parties to the treaty must collectively protect and promote. The preparatory stage of this conference was, uh, as with most international conferences, a rather complex one. There were four preparatory committee meetings spread over 18 months. There were some problems inevitably on the way, but they did agree on an agenda. They did agree on a structure of the conference where the different items of the agenda were discussed. They did agree on background documentation on a set of office bearers, including myself as the president. Unfortunately, that was unanimously decided. But on substance, there were very clearly differences in the views expressed by the various nation states. And, uh, just as much as honest men can disagree, I think nations have a right to perceive their national interests in the way they choose to, and there were some differences. The challenge of international affairs and the challenge of multilateralism is to seek to harmonize these differences and to come up with an optimum result where everybody's national interests are accommodated. And I believe we were able to achieve this. And we were able to achieve this not by having a vote. Many, many countries in the run-up to the conference were convinced that there was no alternative because of the fundamentally divisive nature of the decision that had to be taken and the sides that were being taken already by various countries, that there was no alternative but to vote. It was my fervent conviction throughout that the treaty could best be strengthened by having a consensus decision, by trying to approach this as a consensus building exercise so that a community of interests was forged over the period of time that we met in New York, which was four weeks. The policy setting for the conference was also an interesting one. I believe the United States government took a very, very important decision at a very early stage, which helped to create a climate conducive to the success of this conference. And that decision was President Clinton's decision 
to go for a comprehensive test ban and to forego any further nuclear weapon tests on the part of the United States government. And this meant, because the UK only tests in Nevada, that the UK also had to follow suit. Russia followed suit, partly because Sevipalatinsk has been so contaminated that the people around there would no longer allow the Russian government to test there. It left only China and France, which, as you know, continue to test today. But at least it set a very important marker that the country which had had the most number of tests, over a thousand since 1945, was deciding that that was enough. And uh, this issue of having a ban on all tests for all time in all environment has been a fundamental tenet of a lot of nuclear non non-nuclear weapon states, and therefore it uh, helped to satisfy a major demand of these states. There was also on the part of the United States a very important initiative to have uh, a treaty to cut off the production of fissile material for the production of nuclear weapons. And that is another initiative that is today being discussed in the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva, the single multilateral negotiating body on disarmament. And uh, this again was a signal that we were going along the road towards nuclear disarmament. On other issues, unfortunately, there wasn't the same degree of progress. There were not many non-nuclear weapon states who wanted security assurances that nuclear weapons would not be used against them. They wanted this in a treaty-clad form. But all they got was another Security Council resolution on the eve of the conference, Security Council Resolution 984, which uh, gave undertakings from the five nuclear weapon states that uh, they would not use their nuclear weapons against a non-nuclear weapon state. It was a declaratory statement and uh, fell short of what had been requested. There was also a promise that if a country was attacked with nuclear weapons, these five countries would come to the assistance of the country that was a victim of a nuclear attack. So the policy setting was mixed at the time we met on the 17th of April in New York, but sufficient advances had been made under Article 6 to give some of the countries a sense of hope that we were progressing towards nuclear disarmament. And the intrinsic bargain in the NPT, where the non-nuclear weapon states agreed to renounce the nuclear option under supervision of the International Atomic Energy Agency, was going to be reciprocated by a move on the part of the nuclear weapon states to reduce and finally eliminate their nuclear weapons. When we began the conference on the 17th, it was pretty clear that as a result of uh, lobbying on the part of uh, many countries, there were sufficient votes to, ha to have the treaty extended indefinitely. And the general debate indicated that quite clearly. But I think what was very significant was the contribution of the South African delegation. Now, South Africa was a country which came into the nuclear non-proliferation treaty after having experimented in the development of nuclear weapons itself. And we now know that they had seven nuclear devices which they subsequently destroyed in order to enter the NPT as a non-nuclear weapon state. And the moral influence of a country, A, which had turned its back on its apartheid past in order to come in as a non-racial democracy, and a country which once had nuclear weapons, then deciding to destroy them and join the NPT was considerable. And this country, 
through its foreign minister made a statement during the general debate that I regard as one of the defining moments of the conference. And Foreign Minister Enzo said that his government agreed that the treaty should be extended indefinitely, but not unconditionally. And what he proposed was that there should be a declaration of principles and objectives of nuclear non-proliferation and nuclear disarmament, which would function as a yardstick to measure whether or not the parties to the treaty were in fact implementing their obligations. Secondly, he proposed that we should greatly strengthen and enhance the efficacy of the review process under the treaty, because the treaty already envisaged that every five years the parties should meet in order to review the progress of the treaty and its success. And this had become a ritualistic exercise where there was the usual debate. Sometimes we succeeded in adopting a consensus document, sometimes we didn't. But on this occasion, it was proposed that we should have greater accountability in that process. And that we would, as the American expression goes, hold the feet of the nuclear weapon state to the fire. And I think what finally emerged is precisely that. We have today adopted a greatly strengthened review process, which will ensure that nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states will no longer be able to get away with uh, a failure to adhere to their obligations. In the process of the conference, we devised a number of mechanisms which, uh, in my view, helped in the transparency of the exercise and ensured the participation of all countries, both the large and the small. We also had, very importantly, the active participation of non-governmental organizations. Indeed, at a time when we had 175 countries actually participating in the conference, we had many more NGOs, academic institutes, and others participating in the conference, and through their seminars, through their papers, and through all the activity on the margins of the conference, they helped to enhance the participation of delegations in the conference, illuminate some of the subjects that were discussed at the time, and greatly help in the level of discussion that went on. The presidential consultations that were devised at the time involved about 25 key countries. And by having their included the representatives of the various groups, the Western group, the Eastern group, and the group of non-aligned countries, it was possible to reach out to all the delegations, at the same time also to have a feedback from them to react to what was happening in the consultations. And in this group of consultations, we were able to negotiate and finalize the document that strengthened the review process, the declaration of a set of principles on nuclear non-proliferation and nuclear disarmament, and finally, the decision that extended the treaty indefinitely. And it was the conversion of all these three decisions into three interrelated and parallel decisions that made it a package that went together. At the same time, we were able to have a separate resolution at the request of Arab countries who were greatly exercised over the fact that Israel remained outside the nuclear non-proliferation treaty and had a nuclear weapon capability and needed some kind of an assurance if they were to sign on to the indefinite extension of this treaty under which 
they were legally debarred from acquiring nuclear weapons and felt themselves therefore denuded in their defense against uh, a neighboring country. Well, fortunately, we were able at the last moment to negotiate a resolution that was uh, acceptable to all countries. It did not have to actually name Israel as the Arab countries wanted, but there was enough in the language that made it clear that uh, we were referring to Israel when we talked about a country that was outside the NPT and a country whose nuclear facilities were not under IAEA safeguards. And this appeared to satisfy the Arab countries sufficiently for them to agree to accept the package of the three decisions together with other countries without voting. Now, I think that represented a very significant achievement on the part of the international community. To have voted, in my view, would have been extremely divisive. There were many countries who very strongly felt that there should be no indefinite extension of the treaty and that a 25-year rolling periods of extension would serve the interests of the international community best. And indeed, some of them did have a resolution to this effect, which was finally withdrawn in favor of the package of three decisions. The countries who wanted this 25-year rollover periods made statements after the adoption which uh, may have indicated some bitterness. But I think as sovereign nations, when they acquiesced in the decision, they took a conscious decision that this was the best way to go. And I believe this is something that is possible in international relations to identify areas of common interest and to assemble the building blocks of a consensus in order to reach a decision that is acceptable to the entire community. What of the future? I think history will be the best judge as to whether the achievement that was reached on the 11th of May in New York was a carte blanche for nuclear weapon states to act as they wish, or whether it was in fact a passport, an undertaking to progress towards a nuclear weapon free world. And it is my firm belief and conviction that the events that have taken place since the 11th of May have placed us irreversibly on the road towards nuclear disarmament and therefore vindicates the decision that was taken both politically but far more importantly morally. I believe for example that the decision of President Clinton on the 11th of August to resist the pressures from the Pentagon and to go for a zero level comprehensive test ban rather than a level of 500 tons which were advocated is an indication that the commitments that were made in New York will be honored. I think it is also significant that although China and France are testing their nuclear weapons, those two countries have both committed themselves to signing a comprehensive test ban treaty by the end of 1996. The review process, as I said, is going to ensure the accountability of nuclear weapon states in the future. It is going to be very seriously pursued not only by the treaty parties, but by the non-governmental organizations. And Japan, which is the only country which has been a victim of nuclear bombing twice in its history in 1945, has already signaled its own leadership in this issue. And Prime Minister Moriyama has announced that there would be a meeting in Japan next year where they will set the agenda for future review conferences where the yardstick to measure the achievement of nuclear weapon states will be set. 
The NPT conference in April, May this year had to succeed. It had to succeed for a number of reasons. It had to succeed because of the viability of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty itself, the most widely subscribed to multilateral disarmament treaty, the treaty which has acted as a bulwark holding back the spread of nuclear weapons. It had to succeed for the sake of multilateralism and the importance of a collective achievement being registered internationally. And finally, it had to succeed because of international peace and security. I think as a multilateral treaty, the strength of the NPT rested originally on a multilateral consensus. And the support that it drew from multilateral institutions like the International Atomic Energy Agency, which uh, conducted its safeguards tests. The success of the conference, as I said earlier, was a collaborative achievement. And the search for the key ingredients in its chemistry is therefore far more important than the identification of key individuals or delegations. It was a diplomatic success and it reinforces and renders permanent the international legal norm against the proliferation of nuclear weapons. And at the same time, as I said, it makes an important statement in favor of nuclear disarmament and a nuclear weapon-free world. But uh, we need to make this success a basis for further achievements. And I think that uh, the achievements that have been registered since the 11th of May is an indication that uh, we are going to achieve this. Now, there are many I know who think that uh, nuclear weapons cannot be disinvented. But I would like to say to them that we have, in the recent past, shown that we have the wisdom and the capacity to negotiate the banning of the production and the use of chemical weapons, another weapon of mass destruction. We have signed the Chemical Weapons Convention. We also have a Biological Weapons Convention which bans biological weapons. And I see no reason why nuclear weapons cannot be banned in the future so that this weapon of mass destruction, which we know can destroy the life support systems of the entire universe, will be forever abolished on the face of the earth. I thank you for your patience in listening to me, and I should be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Mr. Ambassador, we thank you for uh, your lucid presentation, which was not only informative, but uh, uh, deeply encouraging. As the Ambassador said, uh, he'll be willing to take questions until 10 minutes after 7. Let me ask you to return, Mr. Ambassador. The floor is now open for questions. This is when the roast begins before the dinner. <laughs> yes, sir. The uh, case of Iraq is a clear example of weaknesses in the verification system of the International Atomic Energy Agency, which had safeguards. But there was a clandestine uh, facility in Iraq which was not detected, not even by the very sophisticated uh, intelligence apparatus of a lot of countries. <laughs> but uh, I think today, with the wisdom that we have gathered, we have a greatly enhanced system of verification that is in place in the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna. It's a program called the 93 plus 2, which uh, has a number of improved technologies for detecting even clandestine facilities. For example, through environmental testing, 
which means that uh, nobody will be able to get away with the kind of uh, cheating that countries have been resorting to up to now. As far as Iran is concerned, there has been no clear proof of any violation of its obligations. What is uh, being discussed at the moment with regard to Iran is the sale of uh, nuclear reactors by Russia to Iran. Uh, this desire to acquire nuclear reactors, I'm told by those uh, in the trade, goes back to the time when the Shah of Iran was uh, in power in Iran. And of course the question naturally arises, why would a country sitting on so much oil want to have nuclear reactors? And this is what bothers a lot of people. It's a question of confidence. But uh, Iran and Russia have both agreed that this sale would take place under IAEA safeguards. And it would be open to inspection. Uh, it has not satisfied some countries, including the United States. But there is no technical violation of the NPT as a consequence of this. Uh, we have also the case of uh, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, which again is a separate case because uh, for a while they withdrew from the treaty and were in that no man's land of neither being outside the treaty nor within the treaty. But here I'd like to pay a tribute to the United States. I don't always do this. <laughs> but uh, they have shown through great patience in their diplomacy an ability to retain the DPRK within the ambit of the treaty. And uh, through a number of very complicated uh, arrangements involving the Republic of Korea and Japan, they have helped to alleviate the danger that was perceived at one stage of a breakout from the treaty by the DPRK. And I think this is a, a lesson for all of us. We talk about rogue states in the international community. And it is so easy for the international community to ostracize rogue states and when they're on the brink to push them over. I think it is a greater challenge for the international community to draw these states back from the brink and bring them into the mainstream of the international community for the greater good of us all. And I think we have achieved this with DPRK. The question is how can you bring industry uh, under the uh, cover of the treaty? Well, industry throughout the world must be located geographically within a nation state. And every nation state has its own laws and regulations to ensure that international treaties, whether it's the NPT or any other treaty, are adhered to. You have the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in this country. And many other countries have their own commissions which uh, supervise the supply by industry of nuclear materials and nuclear technology. There is a licensing requirement. You cannot just export nuclear material to any country. It is true that the subject of nuclear smuggling has acquired greater seriousness in the recent past, particularly with the CIS countries. And this is something which requires international cooperation. It is something which uh, we have to be collectively aware of. I believe that sufficient safeguards have been put in place by the international community to ensure that these incidents are not repeated and that they will not in any way present a threat where subnational groups or terrorist groups can lay their hands on nuclear material in order to build a nuclear weapon. And even if they build a nuclear weapon, they would also, of course, have to have a delivery system. But all this, I think, is uh, under very strict surveillance internationally. It is, again, uh, a fact that uh, there have been instances uh, of uh, material being smuggled in Germany as well. But uh, again, as I said, it requires the international community to work more vigilantly in order to prevent these instances. 
the question is, I think, doesn't the uh, Iraq situation demonstrate that countries are, uh, that uh, industry is able to circumvent na the national controls to which you referred to in your answer? Well, clearly there are a number of gaps in the system which we have all got to address and uh, try to uh, block in some way or another. I believe that the greater stringency in national legislation, and we know that Germany has recently tightened their export laws greatly, not only because of public opinion pressure within Germany, but because of external pressure from Germany's allies, precisely for the reason that you have been pointing out, sir. So that increasingly more and more countries are becoming aware of the dangers of past laxity in procedures. And uh, a number of actions have been taken, both within countries and internationally, to prevent this kind of recurrence. I think more than anything else, it is ultimately the strengthen of, strengthening of the verification system of the International Atomic Energy Agency, where the International Atomic Ener Energy Agency is no longer restricted to examining declared facilities, but could even go on challenge and look at a facility which it suspects to be in existence in a country. And I think that is the, the final way in which uh, the uh, nuclear non-proliferation is going to be uh, ensured. Yes, sir. In the case of India, their position is that the treaty is inherently discriminatory, that it imposes unfair obligations on nuclear weapon states vis-a-vis non-nuclear non -nuclear weapon states, and that until you have a treaty which bans nuclear weapons, they would not be a party to this treaty. In the case of Pakistan, their situation is slightly different. They are ready to join the treaty immediately. India joins it. And we know, of course, that this uh, situation uh, is not in the interests of the international peace and security. It's not in the interests of nuclear non-proliferation. Both countries are nuclear weapon capable. Uh, nobody knows for sure whether they have weapons or not. But uh, it is, I think, now the hope of the international community that with the progress that is being made with the comprehensive test ban treaty, with the cutoff of uh, nuclear fissile material being produced for nuclear weapons, that there would be increasingly pressure on these two countries and Israel to join the treaty. It has happened with regard to other countries. South Africa, as I said, was a clear example of a country which did have nuclear weapons and then destroyed them to come into the treaty. But Brazil and Argentina, some years ago, were the cause of very deep concern internationally. They were said to be engaged in a nuclear arms race. But as a result of uh, both countries becoming democratic countries, I think, and again because of the pressure of domestic and international opinion, there has been a fundamental change there. And uh, the two countries have joined the regional treaty, the Treaty of Tatalelco, which converts Latin America and the Caribbean into a nuclear weapon-free zone. And Argentina has joined the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. Brazil remains out because, again, like India, it feels it's a discriminatory treaty. But uh, we are allayed in our fears about Brazil because it is a member of the Tatalelco Treaty, which has very uh, stringent measures to verify the uh, non-nuclear weapon status of Brazil. I, I believe the question is, are there any devices within the treaty to keep smaller nations from uh, developing nuclear weapons? <coughs> is, is trade, are there trade sanctions or other means of keeping uh, smaller nations from developing weapons? There is no uh, special arrangement in the treaty which addresses the question of small nations. There is, under Article 4, provision for developing countries to be given assistance in uh, 
having some kind of uh, help from the more developed countries for the peaceful uses of nuclear energy. Now, as for sanctions, if you violate the treaty, that is a matter for the Security Council. It is the Security Council who has the final authority on uh, imposing sanctions under Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter for countries who are in violation of their uh, treaty obligations. And uh, this is something which has already been seen in the case of Iraq. Uh, we know that uh, there is UNSCOM which has been established and which keeps reporting to the Security Council on the progress they are making in destroying Iraq's uh, nuclear weapon capability and its capability with regard to other, uh, the development of other mass uh, destruction weapons. How does the, uh, the treaty address the problem of delivery mechanisms? Uh, the NPT itself does not address the issue. There is a separate regime outside of the NPT called the MTCR, the Missile Technology Control Regime, which is a regime where certain countries have freely entered into uh, in order to uh, have some kind of control about the development of missile technology because missile technology is crucial with regard to the delivery capability of uh, not only nuclear weapons but also other weapons of mass destruction. So it is the MTCR that governs uh, the control of missile technology and not the NPT. You read uh, of uh, scare stories sometimes in uh, newspapers and in journals. I don't think anybody has been able to come to an authoritative uh, amount as to how much uh, uranium or plutonium there is afloat. The point, of course, is that it has to be highly enriched uranium uh, because otherwise it would not be weapon usable. Uh, so just to have uh, some uranium floating around doesn't itself mean that somebody's going to make a bomb with it. Speaking of fissionable uh, material floating around, the question is, what is the status of the Soviet experts? Well, that's a good question. I. Uh, don't know. Uh, of course, uh, a lot of them are probably being recycled in different capacities, but uh, there is a, a danger that their knowledge and expertise could be purchased by a lot of uh, countries and, and uh, groups who uh, would like to uh, have their knowledge. But uh, one hopes again there because of the fact that uh, we have a number of uh, programs uh, I think the non-Luga program is an important one where there is assistance to the former Soviet Union with regard to the actual destruction of their nuclear weapons. Uh, a number of uh, avenues are being created for this kind of expert so that uh, he does not misuse his knowledge. Yes, there, was, uh, there were three main committees in the conference which I omitted to mention, uh, which discussed different uh, aspects of the treaty. And uh, one of the committees which went into some of the technical aspects uh, was very much involved in the question of uh, radioactive material because, for example, the African nations have been very, very conscious of the fact that they have in the past been used as a dumping ground for radioactive waste. And uh, prohibitions on this have been entered into. Uh, we know that, uh, for example, the nuclear weapon-free zones such as the uh, South Pacific nuclear weapon free zone, the Treaty of Rarotonga declared that part of the world to be a nuclear weapon free zone. They have a specific provision in that treaty which uh, debars countries from dumping radioactive waste there. Just in those territories? In those territories. And of course, there is an obligation on the part of uh, those who have this material to either recycle the waste or in some way uh, make it uh, harmless as far as uh, human habitation is concerned. That category of weapons uh, is being discussed in the conference on disarmament. And uh, the progress, because I was involved in those discussions myself when I was in Geneva, was uh, set back somewhat because of a decision that they would adopt a two-track approach. One to talk about radiological weapons themselves, which are still a theoretical 
possibility. And the other was to talk about the attacks on nuclear installations, which itself could set off a kind of uh, reaction which would be uh, extremely dangerous to, to life and to property. And uh, as a consequence, there has been uh, no progress, unfortunately, made on that. Uh, and so the uh, question of uh, having a ban on radiological weapons is still a matter of uh, negotiation in Geneva. Uh, what, would you give your picture of uh, the weapons that are out there in the world and fissionable material, and then a, uh, your timetable about r what reasonable reductions would be over a period of time? Well, with the implementation of START 1 and START 2, and mind you, we haven't had the ratification of START 2 in the Senate as yet, uh, we will come down to something like 70% of the total number of nuclear weapons we've had. Uh, it will mean that uh, the uh, USA and Russia would have approximately 3,500 3, nuclear warheads each. And then there are the much smaller nuclear arsenals of France, of China, and the UK. And at some point of time, those nuclear weapons will also have to be placed on the negotiating table for further reductions. I believe that after START II is implemented, there will be a need for us to talk about START III, and then to bring all five nuclear weapon states into a discussion about a further reduction in nuclear weapons. I don't have a crystal ball which uh, tells me exactly where we are going, but I think we are going to achieve nuclear disarmament. Uh, I believe it is a step-by-step -step process. The question of disarmament goes hand in hand with the question of security. We would not have achieved what we had achieved if not for the ending of the Cold War. The ending of the Cold War saw us firstly have a ban on intermediate weapons. We had the INF Treaty, and then we had START I and START II, plus the Bush-Yeltsin Accord. And all this was made possible because of a new international climate of confidence and security. And so, as long as we continue to have this international climate in the post-Cold War era, I'm sure we will achieve greater reductions in nuclear weapons. We must also not try to manufacture new rationales for nuclear weapons. We must not try to look for new enemies. And there is a danger that the military industrial complex cheated of its bogey may want to create new bogies in order to justify a weapons development program. And that is something that requires intense vigilance on the part of civil society so that governments are not pressured by interest groups in order to do this. The, the question is, will you uh, comment well, I, upon... I finally have an opportunity for a, a commercial plug for my country. <laughs> Let me first say that uh, Sri Lanka as a country which has been a functioning democracy since its regaining of independence in 1948, has uh, steadfastly followed an independent foreign policy and has been a faithful member of the United Nations. It uh, believes very firmly in the concept of uh, nuclear non-proliferation and has fulfilled its obligations under that treaty and other treaties which it is a signatory to. At the present moment, Sri Lanka is uh, greatly concerned about an internal problem where a, a group of terrorists in the north have uh, decided that the answer to the grievances of some members of a minority could best be served by the pursuit of a secessionist struggle. And uh, the government, which was elected last year, has in recognition of the fact that there have been mistakes in the past, now produced a set of political proposals which will convert Sri Lanka into a union of freely elected regional councils, where a great deal of autonomy will be given to eight regional councils, 
autonomy which will far exceed the autonomy granted to the states in India, where the chief ministers elected would not be dismissed by the center, where there would be consultation with regard to the implementation of development programs, and where on law and order and land there would be total autonomy on the part of the regional councils. Moderate Tamil parties and groups have accepted this as a very credible basis for negotiation. But the Tamil Tigers, who have been responsible for the assassination of the former Prime Minister of India, Rajiv Gandhi, a President of Sri Lanka and several ministers, as well as a number of Tamil leaders in the democratic mainstream, have intransigently re rejected this set of proposals. And at the moment, the government, finding itself with the conflict reimposed on it as a consequence of the Tamil Tigers violating a cessation of hostilities agreement, has had no alternative but to stem the terrorism of the Tigers, which has resulted in the loss of many innocent civilians. Uh, and a battle is going on in the north. We hope that this will eventually bring the Tigers to the negotiating table so that all of Sri Lanka can enjoy the peace and development which that country richly deserves. Sri Lanka is a country which uh, converted to free market economics much before other countries in South Asia did. In 1977, a decisive election was fought in Sri Lanka which uh, resulted in an economic philosophy being accepted with the private sector being acknowledged as the engine of growth. And this has today become a bipartisan consensual policy on the part of all parties in Sri Lanka. And the economy has uh, grown at the rate of an average of 5% per annum with a great deal of investment possibilities for foreign direct investment with a great deal of space for both the private sector and the foreign investment to work in. We have the United States today as our largest trading partner. We export over a billion dollars worth of made up garments to this country alone. And uh, we welcome the commonality in our political philosophy as far as human rights and the rule of law is concerned. It is therefore I think important for the rest of the international community to understand the struggle that is going on in Sri Lanka as a struggle between democracy and a group of terrorists who would like to have a part of the country secede in order that there could be a one party and mono ethnic state, which I think is uh, deeply destabilizing not just for Sri Lanka but for the region and for the international community. We appreciate very much the time that you've given us, uh, and it was very good of you to honor us with your presence tonight. We thank you very much. Thank you.